Hi students, in the last class we have discussed something about the paleontological evidences in support of organic evolution. Now we have to talk about evidences from comparative anatomy. So similarities in structure between different groups of organisms are actually acted or just accepted as an indicator of relationship. That is study of that is known as for the different groups in relation to anatomy are accepted as what we have the indicators of that is relationship. For example, we have the forelimbs and hindlimb structures. So the forelimbs and hindlimb they exhibit the fundamental actually the forelimbs. Suppose we are studying the comparative anatomy of the forelimbs of a vertebrates. They exhibit a fundamental plan in similarity of structures. A fundamental plan in similarity of structures. And these structures have to be studied or these evidences have to be studied through homologous organs, analogous organs, vestigial organs, atavistic organs and also the connected links. By studying through these topics we can understand the structural similarity and also we can exhibit the common ancestor. That's a mode of phyletic origin. Now under this one, we have to take a book first one. So we want to know the evidences from comparative anatomy. We have to discuss the following headings. Number one, homologous organs. Homologous organs. So in vertebrates, the comparative anatomic studies reveal the basic plan in structural similarities among themselves. If you are studying the vertebrate anatomy comparatively, so we can understand the basic plan in structures among themselves. For example, we have the forelimbs and hindlimbs. If you are taking the forelimbs, the forelimbs exhibit the structural similarity with each other. Structural similarity with each other. And that gives an idea that we have been descended from a common ancestor. So structural similarity with each other. And if you are taking the forelimb skeleton, the forelimb skeleton of vertebrates. The example I am taking, forelimb skeleton of vertebrates. Now, if you are taking the forelimb skeleton, it is having the same basic fundamental structure. Either in the case of cat, or in the case of bat, or in the case of bird, or in the case of human beings, or in the case of horse. So, the forelimb skeleton shows the following structures. You have the bone humerus that forms the upper arm. Then we have radius and ulna, the forearm bones. Radius and alpha. These two form the forearm bones. We have the wrist region, what we call the corpus. We have the corpus. Then the palm region, we have the metacarpus. Metacarpus. And we have the fingers, the digits formed of phalanges. So these are the different bones present in the forelimb skeleton. The same fundamental structure have been observed. If you are taking either for example cat or bat or a bird or a horse or in the case of for example even human being or in the case of whale. So in all these animals we have the same fundamental pattern of bones. That means they have similar origin. All the bones in our skeletal system normally developed from the mesut. So, those organs which have similar fundamental pattern of structures, having similar origin. But, if you analyze the nature of the functions, in the case of cat, it is used for walking. In the case of bat, it is used for flight. So both in the case of birds and bat, we have the structures, the forelimbs are modified for flight. In the case of horse, it is for running. In the case of human beings, it is used for different purposes. In the case of whale, it is like what is called a flipper. 
The panel, the structure is called clipper. That is used for swimming. That is used for swimming. So, the structures which have fundamental, which have similar fundamental pattern of structures, which have similar origin, but perform different functions. They are called homologous organs. And the phenomenon is called homology. And the phenomenon is called homology. So organs which have the same fundamental pattern of structure, same origin, but they perform different functions. As you see here, flipper of whale is used for swimming. Now the wing of bat and boat is for what we call the flight. The cat is for walking and the horse for running. So this phenomenon is called homology. So normally the homologous organs bring about what is called divergent evolution. Bring about divergent evolution. So they represent what is called divergent evolution. And divergent evolution from a single what is called ancestor. Various groups of organisms have been evolved or a structure has been modified to perform different functions. So same origin, same fundamental pattern but perform different functions and such organs are called homologous organs and the phenomenon is called homology. Now if you are taking the plant examples, let us take one example. Now the thorn of Bougain Villa, the thorn of and also we have the tendril and also the tendril of Paisam and the cucumber. So these two, namely the tendril as well as the thorn, they are considered as a homologous organs. The reason for that one, the thorn of Bhagavad and the tendril of Bison Sataiba, they have actually originated from axillary bud. Axillary bud. So the modified axillary bud, they are modified into either thorn or tendril. Okay, same origin. Then what is the function they perform? The thorn of Bougain Villa. So they provide actually the use as a defense mechanism. Defense against. We can write defense mechanism against or from or against. I can take that way only. Against the grazing animals. Against the grazing animals. So they get protection, they get protection, so that they cannot be grazed by what is called the grazing animals. That is about the nature of the thorn. What about the tendril? They provide support, they provide support for climbing, supported for climbing. So, if you are taking the basic fundamental structure and origin wise, both have been originated from the axillary part. And the thumb, the function is different. And for tendon, the function is different. One for acting as a defense mechanism, as in the case of thorn, against the grazing animals, protection from the grazing animals. The next one, the tendon is used for actually climbing. It is used as a support for climbing. So, they have different functions but have same origin. Hence, there are examples for homologous organs. So this is one which supports the evidence in relation to comparative anatomy. So the presence of such homologous structures which bring about the divergent evolution is an example for or it shows the organisms have a common ancestor. Structurally they are modified, function wise modified like that. Now let's go for the second one in support of comparative anatomy evidences. in support of what is called organic evolution from comparative anatomy, analogous organs. Now, 
formula is more against similar in origin, functional is different. It is opposite. The analogous organs, they are different in their structural pattern and also different in origin. But they perform a common function and a similar function. So it is opposite to the homologous organs. Now normally the homologous organs bring about divergent evolution. Now the analogous organs just actually bring about convergent evolution. Convergent evolution. So analogous organs result in convergent evolution. That is nothing but the evolution of different groups towards one group. In the case of divergent evolution, evolution of different groups from a single group which are closely related. But in convergent evolution, the organisms which are converging towards point are widely separated, not related. Now coming back to this one. The examples for analogous organs. If you are taking the wing of bird and butterfly, the wing of bird is formed of muscles, feathers and bones derived from different what is called the germinal layers. And if you are taking the butterfly wing, it is nothing but the extension of cuticle. So origin wise, the bird and butterfly wings are different. But what is the common function they perform? But they are involved doing one common function, they are both used for flight. This is one. Then, another example. If you are taking the eye of octopus, it is a mollusk. And mammals, it is a vertebrate. So the eye of octopus and mammals, they are different in their origin, but their function related to the sight. The first one for flight, the second one for sight. Now the third one, the flipper. The paddle-like structure found in the case of whales or dolphins or in the case of penguins. Now the flipper of dolphins or whale and a penguin, they are actually different, that is in their organization, structural pattern, origin. But they are used for one function and both are used for simply swimming. The flipper of dolphins and the penguin, they are used for swimming. So in the first case, function, flight, <coughs> sorry. The second case, that is for sight. The third case, the flipper, in both the cases, is for swimming. So you have so many examples. But if you are comparing the wing of bat and bird, they are not coming into the homologous organs. Because in the case of wing of bat, the wing is formed of patagium, a skin fold. It is nothing but the extension of the skin fold. And whereas in the case of bone, it is formed of muscles, bones and feathers. So origin wise, though they are having actually coming into the vertebrates, origin wise they have different origin. Regarding the function, both are used for flight. So they are coming into the analogous organs, not for homologous organs. Even if you are taking the sting of honeybee, the sting of what is called scorpion, both are functionally same, that is affluence but they are different in origin. Like that we have a number of examples under zoology or under animals and similarly we have examples in plants also. Now if you are taking for example sweet pea, sorry I am taking sweet pea, not sweet pea, sweet potato and also we have what is called the potato. And these two are concerned with the function of storage, common function for storage. If you are just analyzing the nature of origin, sweet potato is nothing but a root modification. This is root modification. And this is stem modification. It's a stem tuber, we can say, stem modification. So the origin of these two are different, that is sweet potato and potato, but functionally same, both are concerned with the storage of food. So the first one is a modification of root, the second one potato is a modification of stem. Hence Now, the organs which support 
There is the harmonic evolution through comparative anatomy of the vestigial organs. What are vestigial organs? In short, we can say reduced functionless organs. Now, these organs are those organs we can say this way, those organs which are of no use to the possessor, though present in the body, no use to the possessor, and are not necessary for their existence. Even their present or absent, nothing would happen to the body. That's why they are not necessary for their existence. It's an example of vermiform appendix, like that. We'll go for it. Now, these organs are the remnants of the structures. The remnants of the structures. The word remnants referring to the structures which are left. So, these are the remnants of structures which were well developed in the case of ancestors, but now reduced and disappeared because of their non-utilization. So these organs were well developed and functional in the case of ancestors. And in the case of, that is, present organisms, they became reduced, non-functional or even disappeared because of non-utilization. Say an example of, that is, sepia. In the case of mammals, we have a structure what is called sepia attached to the large intestine at the junction of the small intestine and large intestine. The cecum is well developed in the case of herbivorous animals because the herbivorous animals are feeding on grasses or any other cellulosic materials. It is a place of digestion of cellulose. But in course of time, in the case of human beings, for example, now there is a change in diet containing less cellulose. So there is no need to develop the sacrum more and more. So it becomes reduced and then functionless. And is represented as a small tubular structure. Suppose this is what is called the sacrum and this is what is called the vermiform appendix. Vermiform appendix. This is what we call the small intestine and this is a large intestine. Or we call the collar part. So the vermiform appendix is an example for that is a vestigial organ. Another one, ear muscles. Now the ear muscles are called auricular muscles. They are called auricular muscles. Our ancestors had the ability of oscillating the ear lobes because of the functional activity of auricular muscles. But in course of evolution, they lost their function and become reduced. Now we cannot oscillate the ear lobes, and that is auricular muscles. Then cortex. The vertebral column ends in what is called a small process formed by the union of four vertebrae and that is called cortex. That represents what is called actually the remnant tail of our ancestors. The wisdom teeth, what we call the last molar. The last molar may be present or absent. In some cases, individuals, the wisdom teeth form only at the age of 21. But in some individuals, the teeth absent. So they represent what we call the vestigial organ, the mammalian males. Mammy means the mammary glands function in the case of females, but it is reduced in the case of males. The nectitating membrane towards the inner corner of the eye, if you are taking the inner corner of the eye, there is a small muscular lobe that is nothing but the reduced nectitating membrane, which is represented in what is called plica cellularis. Plica semilunaris. We can find it towards the inner corner of the eye. Just we can see there is a, a small lobe that is a reduced nectitating membrane which were developed in our ancestors. Hair on the body. The presence of dense hair all over the body. An apex structure. Ancestral humans had dense hair on the surface of the body. In course of evolution, in course of time, they disappear. So these are present, even in some cases you can find it. Just dense hair on the surface of the body in the case of males. They represent the bodies of the vestigial organs of our ancestors, well done. So they support the vestigial organs in support of organic evolution through comparative anatomy. Now, I want to give one more information. 
Now, as we have more than 180 vestigial organs, we have more than 180 vestigial organs, that was reported by Wheeler Sheen, a person by name Wheeler Sheen. He reported more than 180 vestigial organs without any functions. That's why humans are described as moving museum of antiquities. Antiquities, you know, that don't age thing. Museum means normal, we have a museum only the dead animals and plants. But here the animals actually we have the organs, functionless. Hence they are considered as an equal to, considered as equal to what is called the dead animals or plants. That's why human beings are called moving museum of antiquities as they have more than one eight vestigial organs reported by Wheeler Sheen. Another evidence in support of organic evolution from comparative anatomy are the connecting links. So these are the what is called the transitional groups of the animals having the characteristics of two different groups. Hence called transitional forms. Transition means temporary, changing from one group to another. So these are all what is called the groups of animals which are normally considered as actually intermediate stage which are normally transitional groups in between the two groups of organisms. Organisms having the characteristics of two different groups are called connecting links or transitional forms or what is called intermediate forms. Now we have a number of examples. Peripatus. Now it is now placed under the separate words for the flywheel, only go for a. The peripatus is having the characteristics when we annelid an arthropod, for example, annelid an character, presence of nephridia, arthropod and character, presence of open circulatory system and trachea. So that is why it is called connecting link, possessing the characteristics of annelid an arthropod. Neoplina, the recently discovered mollusk. It is also an example for living fossil. <coughs> now this neoplina is acting as a connecting link between annelid and mollusk. Having the molluscal characters along with the segmentation of the body like underlids. Now, Euglena, you know that one, the animal which contained a chloroplast. But having an eye spot, that's why it's being placed under that is animals. It possesses the characters of both plants and animals. For example, in having the chloroplast, plant character, animal character, the possession of what is called eye pigment. And that is why it is place in between plants and animals and a connecting link. Proteospongia, a colonial protozoa. This is a protozoa. Having the characteristics of both protozoa and porifera and having the flagellated collar cells. It's not necessary for you studied about flagellated collar cells in 11th standard. That is a poriference. Quinocytes. Now this is a colonial protozoa having the quinocytes similar to the porifera and also it is a protozoa that is a connecting link. Latimeria, a low fin fish, it is also called as a living fossil, only one representative. In other actual fishes we have the fins supported by fin rays but not muscles. But this is the only fish available with muscles in the fins. That is why it is called low fin fishes. The fins are just like a low. And it is acting as a connecting link between fishes and amphibians. So this is not the connecting links, the living connecting links. We also have what is called extinct connecting links or fossil connecting links. So the extinct fossils are extinct animals or the fossils as connecting links. One, the bird, Archaeopteryx. What is called actually a lizard bird having teeth in its mouth but extinct. So it is a connecting link between reptiles and birds and possessing both reptilian and then avian characters. Simoria, it is a connecting link between amphibians and reptiles. Another extinct form, Ichthyostrega, a connecting link between fishes and amphibians. So these are actually extinct and these are all the living connecting links. That is about what we have the connecting links. More examples also we have. I will provide in the table column in the slides.
the last one in support of comparative anatomy for our morning evolution comes from atavistic organs. What is atavism? Sudden reappearance of vestigial organs or ancestral characters in highly evolved organisms is called atavism. Sudden reappearance of vestigial organs in highly evolved animals. So all of a sudden in one of the generations we have the reappearance of vestigial organs in higher animals or highly evolved organisms. For example, in some cases, in a rare instance, presence of tail in newborn baby, presence of short stubby tail in a newborn baby, that is an example for a tarvistic character. Because the tail is present only in our ancestors, not now. Then the presence of long canine teeth. The canine teeth is normally shown for tearing the flesh. But in the case of our adult ancestors, they had long canine teeth that reappeared all of a sudden in a particular person during lifetime. That is called actually a tarvistic one. The third one, the presence of dense hair, have already seen that is a vestigial structure present in the surface of the body. In some humans, you can find particularly in the case of males, presence of dense hair all over the body surface, even in the surface of the chest. These are all the examples for tarvistic organs. So they also support actually the organic evolution through comparative anatomy of different organs. That means similarities in structures are accepted as what is called the relationship between different groups of organisms.